Hello and welcome to the Estate Planning Toolbox. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to check out everything we have going on here. My name is John Connor and I am an attorney in the Trust and Estates Group of Graves Doherty here in Ann Moody, a law firm located in downtown Austin, Texas. This podcast is a client-focused podcast covering various estate planning topics, including wills and trusts, powers of attorney, corporate entities such as LLCs and limited partnerships, probate administration, and everything in between. Thanks very much for stopping by. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Estate Planning Toolbox. This is episode two. That's right, we have two episodes now, plural episodes. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of the estate planning necessities and we'll be talking about the powers of attorney. We'll be talking about the statutory durable power of attorney, the medical power of attorney, and a few other documents that go along with those. Before we do that though, let's take a look at our movie quote of the day. It's a pretty easy one and I will be somewhat disappointed if you don't know it off the top of your head, but here it is. Today's movie quote of the day is, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I hope you know what it is, but But if you don't, stick around until the end and I will reveal what movie that is from. The documents that we'll be discussing today are really about incapacity planning, which is very different from testamentary planning. The will that we discussed in our previous podcast is testamentary planning. It only takes effect when you die. These documents are all about protecting you and making sure that you are taken care of if you are alive but suffering from some kind of an incapacity. So jumping in, we'll start off by talking about the statutory durable power of attorney. You might have also heard of this referred to as the financial power of attorney. This is the document in which the person signing the document, also sometimes referred to as the principal, will appoint an agent for purposes of managing their personal property. That would include things like bank accounts, brokerage accounts, other personal property items, and even some real property items. As obvious as it may seem, when you are thinking about the statutory durable power of attorney and who you'd like to name as your agent, you'll want to be sure that you name someone that you trust because this person will be responsible for acting on your behalf if that becomes necessary and they will have access to things like your bank account and your brokerage accounts. Um, They will always have to act in your best interest, but again, you just want to make sure that you're appointing someone that, that you trust. One consideration that you'll have to keep in mind is whether to make the statutory durable power of attorney effective immediately or only upon your incapacity. Typically, I recommend to my clients that they make this document effective immediately, and I do that for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that it can be somewhat time-consuming and cumbersome to actually have the principal declared incapacitated, and in that time, you may have bills that need to be paid or other things that need to be taken care of, but no one to actually do that. The second reason that I typically recommend that the power of attorney be made effective immediately is for the notion that why would you trust someone when you don't have capacity if you don't trust them when you do? And it's for those reasons that I typically recommend to clients that they make the power of attorney effective immediately. The next document that we'll discuss is the medical power of attorney. This one is fairly obvious. This has to do with medical decisions. In this document, the principal or the person creating the document appoints an agent for purposes of making medical decisions on their behalf. Very important to understand that this document is only effective when the principal is actually incapacitated. The law is very clear that if you have capacity, you get to make your medical decisions. No one can come in and overrule you. When you are considering whom to appoint as your agent under your medical power of attorney, I typically suggest to folks that they think about who will be at the hospital when you need them to be. For that reason, you don't want to appoint someone who is perhaps overseas or unreliable. You want someone who's going to be there and at the hospital ready to make a decision when you need them to. There's also a couple of documents that go along with the medical power of attorney. One of those is the HIPAA authorization. Now, this document is not one that necessarily gives anyone any power. What it does is it authorizes doctors to speak with certain individuals about your private medical information. This is very important because we want to make sure that those individuals that you have named in your medical power of attorney can get all of the medical information they need in order to make an informed decision on your behalf. We certainly don't want a situation where doctors are asking your medical agent to make a decision, but the medical 
agent is having to more or less fire in the blind on a decision because they don't have the information that they need. Again, this document doesn't give anyone any power. It just informs doctors who they can talk to about your medical information. And for that reason, we list the same people that are listed on your medical power of attorney in this document as well. Another document that goes along with the medical power of attorney is the directive to physicians. And in this document, the principal is indicating what they want their doctors to do in, in two different scenarios. The first scenario is when the principal is suffering from a terminal condition, meaning that doctors have determined that you are likely to die within the next six months. And the second scenario is when the principal is suffering from an irreversible condition, that being something like Alzheimer's or dementia. In, in either case, you can consider the scenario where perhaps you slip into a coma, and it may be that the doctors can bring you back out of that coma, but you will still have terminal condition and or you will still have an irreversible condition. So the two choices to consider for both of these scenarios are the same, and they are, one, that the principal can instruct their physicians to provide them with all the life-sustaining treatment possible. That would mean chemotherapy, that might mean life support, things of that nature. The other choice is to instruct your doctors to withhold all treatments except those necessary to make them comfortable and to let nature run its course. That would include things like food and water, maybe a feeding tube or artificial hydration, as well as pain medication, something like morphine. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's important to discuss this document and these scenarios and choices with your estate planning attorney and so that you can make sure that you understand them fully because the idea would be that you would make these decisions and have this document and if this either of these scenarios ever came up and you weren't able to make your wishes known, you would have this document and even your medical power of attorney wouldn't really be able to overrule them. The final document we'll discuss is the Declaration of Guardian. This document is important because it acts as a backstop to all those other documents, and most notably the financial power of attorney and the medical power of attorney. Essentially, if a judge were to ever decide that you needed to have a guardian appointed, either a guardian of your person, which would be medical, or a guardian of your estate, which would be financial, a ruling appointing either a guardian of the person or the guardian of the estate would result in the corresponding power of attorney being revoked. So for that reason, in this Declaration of Guardian, we name the same agents and in the same order that you did in your medical power of attorney and your financial power of attorney. So we would name the same agents that you named in your financial power of attorney for your guardian of the estate, and we'd name the same agents that you did in your medical power of attorney for your guardian of the person. The idea being if a judge decided you need a guardian, this document would be presented to the judge, and then the judge would appoint the same folks and in the same order so that everyone could kind of keep doing what they're doing and nothing would change and you wouldn't have someone appointed that you didn't necessarily want to. Kind of wrapping things up, these documents are all about incapacity planning. They're not documents that are effective in any way when you die. These are to make sure that you are cared for while you are alive, but perhaps suffering from some kind of incapacity. It's important in all of these documents to name someone that you trust, and in terms of the medical power of attorney, it's important to name someone who will be at the hospital when you need them to be there so that they can make a medical decision on your behalf if necessary. It's important to go ahead and discuss these appointments with your agents, especially the primary agents, one, so that they know they're appointed, and two, so that they know your wishes and they can act on those. These documents are a very critical part of your estate plan because, again, while the will is a must-have of any estate plan, that's testamentary planning. It doesn't have any effect while you're alive. These documents are all about protecting you and your wishes and your assets while you are alive. So here we are for those that stuck around until the end. The answer to the movie quote of the day is Finding Nemo. When life gets you down, you know what you got to do? I don't want to know what you got to do. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. What do we do? We swim. Thank you again for stopping by for today's podcast. Here again is my contact information. If you have any questions or have any topics you'd like me to discuss, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email or give me a call. And thank you again for stopping by and check back in soon for our next podcast.